Good morning, everybody, here in the room and on the live stream. It's my pleasure to open the second day of our annual research conference. Um, I have an important announcement to make. Uh, you have won the first prize. The first prize is that um, we are start the session on time, despite the early, the early time. And um, so we have a session here, uh, which is interesting in terms of uh, a combination of a macro paper and the combination of a finance paper. It's great to see these two subfields of economics in such nice harmony. So we will have a first paper on uh, an old topic in new clothes uh, with a new perspective um, on um, timing consistency and credibility in central bank policy making. And then also a very topical conference, a t t topical um, t a second finance paper on um, the development of the decline in bank credit relative to other intermediation approaches that is in modern times is progressing so fast. Um, so with, without much further ado, I would like to ask Pierre Jarrett from the um, Columbia Business School to take the stage. Um, Pierre is then professor of international business uh, in, uh, in Colombia and his work on macroeconomic policy and political economy, as you will see in a second. Great. Yeah, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted and honored to be here. I'm presenting work today with uh, Hassan Afruzi, who's my colleague at Columbia, Marina Halleck at Yale, and Ken Rogoff at Harvard. Uh, so let me begin. Oh boy, sorry. Um, all right, here we go. Okay, so the motivation for uh, the paper is we want to think about commitment to inflation targeting, which is a hallmark of modern central banking, and we want to think about that issue, commitment and credibility, uh, in the context of a modern macro model. The previous literature has some uh, limitations. You know, the previous literature goes back to the 80s, Barrow Gordon and Rogoff. And uh, some of those limitations are that it's hard to think about credibility, and as that credibility interacts with the, the deep economic parameters of the environment, um, we, that, that literature doesn't really have transitional dynamics. Uh, that literature also doesn't allow us to think about credibility in a quantitative context. And what we're going to offer in this paper is uh, a framework to think about that issue in the benchmark uh, Calvo model that, that is known to all of you. Uh, and that's going to be a dynamic, nonlinear framework. Why does it need to be nonlinear? Well, if you're thinking about long-term inflation, you cannot think about long-term inflation by assuming that long-term inflation is zero, which is what the normal models do. So that's so we're going to go away, move away from that. I do want to mention that while I'll be going through uh, a more complicated uh, model, we have a. Uh, a sister paper uh, in Brookings that uh, does everything very easily and shows that the entire thing reduces to a long run aggregate supply curve and uh, something that might be offensive to some of you, a long run aggregate demand curve, and that uh, those two can shift and that you can think about long run inflation as, as a sort of an outcome of those two things. So, so I, right, you know, if you're interested in this, you can look at that paper. So here's a preview of the model and the results. We're going to take a off-the-shelf, nonlinear uh, New Keynesian model with Calvo pricing. This has two particular uh, frictions you can think of. First, uh, firms underproduce and underhire because of monopoly power. Second, there's misallocation because of the price dispersion where low price varieties end up having too many workers and produce too much uh, relative to the high price varieties. Uh, there's non-neutrality of money in, uh, in terms of super uh, non-neutrality in the sense that long run, higher long-run inflation uh, results in higher uh, misallocation and dispersion, but also lower monopoly distortion. So there you can see sort of a long-run trade-off. Uh, and in that framework, what we're going to do is to consider the issue of credibility by analyzing the Markov perfect competitive equilibrium, which is a very stark, extreme situation where uh, the central bank optimizes at every date. You know, we think about reality as somewhere in between complete commitment, and we solve that, and this other extreme situation of absolutely zero commitment. So we don't think this is a representation of reality, but it's a benchmark to think about this issue of commitment. Uh, 
uh, what we can show is that uh, in equilibrium, the central bank is going to try to undo monopoly distortions at every single date. And then after you realize that, you can uh, write down the model as a system of three equations. It's a forward-looking nonlinear Phillips curve. It's a backward-looking uh, dispersion dynamics equation. And then it's, uh, we show you that you can create this auxiliary variable, this pass-through of wage, uh, real wages uh, to uh, inflation. And, and there's an equation defining that. And then you can solve the entire thing. So I'm going to show you, and, and we do this in a deterministic setting, but we think that there's a broader contribution here, which is that the uh, tools and techniques introduced here can be used for thinking about uh, an economy with shocks as well in, in a tractable way. So uh, uh, three main results first, and I'll focus really on the first two for the purpose of this presentation. Um, basically, we can uh, exactly show how uh, changes in the economic environment will drive long-run inflation. Uh, and this is important because in the case of commitment, changes in the economic environment have no effect on long-run inflation. Here, because of the lack of commitment, changes in the economic environment, in particular an increase in the labor wedge or a decrease in the elasticity of substitution, result in higher long-run inflation. Part of what we talk about in, in terms of the uh, applications of this in the Brookings paper is how you can utilize that some of these observations to think about the drivers of long-run inflation over the past four decades and how you can think about long-run inflation into the future. We argue that the forces that drove it down in the past are likely to, to reverse and drive it upward into the future. So that's kind of the application, though I'm not going to dwell on this for the purpose of this paper, but just so you can see what the application is. The second result, uh, which was surprising to us, is that uh, in a transition from a low inflation steady state to a high inflation steady state, inflation will overshoot along the path. And that's, uh, uh, that's driven by the interaction of central bank incentives and the changes in the economy. So if we're going to go from a 2% steady state to a 3% you know, or 4% steady state, we're going to have inflation overshoot at the beginning and then gradually decline back down to that 3% uh, steady state. And then we, we find that uh, what I'll say about the third part, which we're is still we're re revising that part, is that the, uh, uh, the cost of lack of commitment can be large, and uh, lack of commitment interacts in a very sensitive way to parameters. And there's some deep economics there that relate to, to, to other observations in the literature. Maybe I can talk about them. I'll skip the related literature, but you, you, you probably are familiar with some of this related literature. OK. So the model that we have is a standard uh, woodford galley uh, model, uh, the, the Calvo model with sticky prices. You have consumers. They consume. They work. Um, with, uh, so what do they do? They choose to buy a bunch of varieties. Uh, they choose to buy some nominal bonds. They do that with their labor income. They uh, also uh, take the interest and the principal from their nominal bonds. We set it up. Uh, for, you know, there's many ways to set it up as them buying and selling stocks of different companies and getting some dividends from those companies. And um, what you get are these optimality conditions uh, for uh, the optimal level of varieties, which gives you, uh, you know, a consumption bundle, C, uh, CT. Uh, you have the price index. Uh, you have intertemporal and intratemporal conditions that pop out. And then you can think about uh, the share price of a firm, which is, uh, you know, the price of a firm is the NPV of its future profits. Um, and uh, so that's basic, basic stuff there. Uh, and I'm going to just describe the economy quickly before I get into the, you know, the, 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 the aggregation and the, the, the Markov model. You, you have firms that can change prices in every period with probability 1 minus theta. Uh, they maximize their, the value of their stock price. What we have here is a payroll tax tau um, that you can see here from the, that has to be deducted from the firm's costs. After you substitute in, you see that every single flexible price firm is going to choose a price P star uh, in this model. Uh, and the one assumption we're going to make, which deviates from many, many models out there is we're going to assume that the government does not establish a payroll tax to undo monopoly distortions. Okay, so that's, there's not going to be a payroll subsidy to undo all monopoly distortions. So that's, that's the, the main assumption. Why do we have that? Because if we didn't have that, there's no commitment problem. Okay, so this introduces a commitment problem uh, because now the central bank has potentially an interest in undoing monopoly distortions. The, the central bank at every date sets the nominal interest rate. Uh, you also have fiscal policy in the background, though it, it doesn't really matter, uh, as you'll see. But fiscal authority chooses some lump sum taxes. It chooses nominal bonds. It has a government budget constraint. So here's the order of events. The order matters. 
if I change the order, I can't solve it as easily anymore, okay? Um, but uh, so the order matters. So first firm set prices. The order is very much like Barrow Gordon in that you have prices and then you choose policy. So firms uh, that are flexible, they set their prices. Um, if they're flexible, otherwise they choose the sticky prices from yesterday. Uh, the central bank then chooses the interest rate, then the households uh, optimize, and then the fiscal authority chooses lump sum taxes and debt. Okay? So that's the order of events. There's a whole bunch of equilibria that you can have in this setting. We're going to look, focus on the issue of credibility and commitment by considering the Markov uh, equilibrium. Okay? So what's a Markov equilibrium? Every single decision or strategy by every player, the firms, the households, the, gov the government, the, the central bank, uh, are a function only of the minimal uh, uh, payoff uh, relevant variables. Okay? Now, because of Riccardian equivalence, that means the level of nominal debt doesn't really matter. So without any loss of generality, you can just set that to zero because it's because you know the, the set of continuation Markov equilibria at every single date is not dependent on that level. So I don't have to worry about it. So then you can think about a game here uh, with the following strategies. Um, you know, flexible price firms enter the period, they see price distribution omega t minus one. That's all of the prices chosen at date t minus one. And as a function of those, they set their flex price P star, okay? That determines in the distribution of prices that we will be entering the period in with tomorrow omega t. I, I, I want to emphasize that because it is actually important because it helps us solve the whole thing, which is that the state variable tomorrow is essentially chosen at the beginning of the period today when the flex price firms determine their price. Okay? And the central bank takes that as given. Then the central bank chooses the nominal interest rate as a function of the distribution of prices omega t. And then households make their decisions as a function of omega t, the distribution of prices and the interest rate. And a Markov equilibrium is a collection of all of these mappings. Okay? Uh, all right, so that's, so that's the setup. Now, in order to, it's a Markov perfect competitive equilibrium. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bunch of, uh, I'm going to do a primal approach to show you what needs to be true for this to be competitive. Okay, so a bunch of aggregation. I'll show you it's going to reduce down to three equations. Then after I do that, there's going to be a bunch of equilibria that'll be a possible. I'll briefly show you the, the commitment one, and then I'll say, let's focus on the Markov. Okay, so that's kind of, that's where I'm going. All right, so let's do some aggregation. Um, you can uh, do market clearing of the, of the, the product market and, and labor market, and basically what you get is that you can define a variable DT, which is dispersion. It's basically distribute dispersion of prices. It's got to be bigger than one. If it's equal to one, it means all the prices are the same. If it's bigger, it means some prices are high, some prices are low. Um, it's like a TFP variable because the total amount of production is equal to the amount of labor divided by dispersion. So the higher dispersion, the worse, uh, the lower the production holding labor fixed. And uh, there's just a couple of things that'll pop out later that are useful to think about. One is the labor share, we call it mu t, which is the, actually the, the, uh, the ratio of the marginal rate of uh, substitution, marginal product of labor. Uh, and uh, I'll show you that that kind of is, that's gonna be play an important role later, and then the, the real wage, okay? Uh, all right. So. Let me show you how this whole thing reduces down to, to a simple system. First, um, dispersion is a backward-looking equation. Dispersion of prices today is a function of uh, the uh, inflation today and the dispersion from yesterday. So the higher the dispersion yesterday, uh, the higher the uh, dispersion today. And also, it turns out, as you might imagine, that the higher the inflation today, the higher is the dispersion today. Okay, so more inflation leads to more dispersion. All right. Then you've got a nonlinear Phillips curve, uh, which pops out. And uh, we have a way of uh, writing that uh, recursively, uh, uh, which is uh, as follows. It sort of looks like the one you're all familiar with. It just has a little twist in there, which is that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, inflation, you have inflation today over here, you have inflation tomorrow over here, then you've got the real wage, okay, sorry to be pointing, and then the key new thing is this delta T, which is a pass-through from uh, future inflation into 
or from, sorry, the pass through from real wages to current inflation. That's the right way to think about it. And that's a function of the sort of all future inflation rates. So it's got a nice recursive structure, which, is, which helps to solve this whole thing. Um, all right, so, and like in standard Phillips curve, if I hold that pass through fixed, higher current wages leads to higher inflation, higher future inflation leads to higher current inflation holding things fixed. Um, so just to give you a flavor of how the model works uh, and why there is no, uh, there, money is not super neutral, uh, you can think about hypothetical steady states uh, in this world and say, well, what do these hypothetical steady states look like? Um, turns out they can only have inflation within a certain bound. We can talk about that later if you're interested. But uh, those hypothetical steady states have a feature uh, that if you're in a steady state with higher inflation, that is necessarily a steady state with higher price dispersion. That's sort of intuitive. There's going to be more sticky price firms left behind. Okay, But you're also in a steady state with a higher labor share or lower markups. Why is that? Well, it's because you've got more overhiring by sticky price firms, and that greater overhiring by sticky price firms is overwhelming the other force, which is that flex, flex price firms are anticipating the inflation by increasing their prices a lot. So you've got this race going on between the sticky price firms and the flex price firms that's resulting in higher labor share, lower markups, the higher the uh, inflation rate. Uh, so it does mean that there's a steady, straight, set, steady state trade-off between um, dispersion, uh, which you can think about as a distribution of distortion, and the aggregate monopoly distortion. So there's a trade-off between aggregate distortion and the distribution of distortions that exists in such a setup. That's observation number one. Observation number two is that um, you know nothing pins down inflation dynamics here. I can easily just have an immediate transition from, an inf of a, from a steady state with 2% inflation to a steady state with 3% inflation or 4% inflation. Nothing prevents that. You can have those dynamics in such a setup. All right, so how are we going to pin down the uh, equilibrium policy. Uh, let me just give you a benchmark, and I'm not going to dwell on this one, but there's some interesting observations here. It's been studied before. Here's a benchmark. Uh, let me think about a central bank with commitment. Let me observe that I can write the objective function as a function of dispersion, D, and labor share mu. That's some algebra. Turns out you can write this thing recursively, but that's, that's not important. We solved the sequence problem also. But the key thing to note is that in, if you have commitment, so if a central bank at date zero were to solve this problem, okay, and remember, there is a monopoly distortion, so you, all, you kind of have an incentive to undo it. But the key thing is that you have zero, you, do nev you never undo it in the long run. You commit to not undoing it in the long run. You commit to a flex price economy in the long run. That's, an, that's a result. It is the only steady state under commitment. What does that mean? Uh, that in the long run, you have zero inflation under commitment. Moreover, the economic environment does not affect long-run inflation. So if you want to give me a theory of how the economic environment affects long-run inflation, you have to start talking to me about central bank incentives, which is what we are going to be doing next. Okay? So let's talk about central bank incentives. I'm going to do it in the Markov model. Uh, what's the payoff relevant variable here? Payoff relevant variable is uh, the dispersion of prices. It's a sufficient statistic for the entire distribution of prices because it subsumes the entire distribution of prices. The central bank takes the disper dispersion of prices today, and guess what? It also takes the dispersion of prices tomorrow as given. Why? Because the, the firms at date T set their prices prior to the central bank choosing the interest rate. So from the central bank's perspective, it's behaving a, in a very myopic way where it just takes the price the, uh, the, the entire sequence of prices into the future as given. And those prices, of course, internalize central bank incentives. Um, and so as a consequence, the central bank ends up stimulating the economy in order to undo monopoly distortions. What's interesting, and this is relative to Barrow Gordon, is that, it's not, is that all firms realize that the central bank is doing this. And it's not just the firms at date T that realize that this is going on. It's all the, all the firms prior to the current moment realize that this is what the central bank is doing. So, so that's what happens. Uh, no commitment. The, the labor share or the markup, it undoes all of the markups. What that means is you can write down that system of equations I had before by substituting in the labor share. Okay, So this is the same exact system as before. And then this is only to facilitate the, uh, the dynamics of the analysis, not the steady state analysis. I'm going to take time to zero. We're going to write this all out in uh, 
continuous time, and so now you've got three equations. Um, you have the dispersion, that backward-looking dispersion equation, the nonlinear Phillips curve, and the uh, wage pass-through equations. Uh, I don't know what those words mean at the bottom of the slide. Those are Hassan's words, Has Hartan, I don't know what that means. But anyway, it's a complicated thing. Uh, and so the, main, uh, so the main thing that you get, uh, this is, I'll, I'll, now, I'll now go through my results, okay? So the first result is um, there's a unique steady state in the Markov game, okay? That steady state defines a level of inflation and a level of dispersion. And interestingly, you can make claims about how different uh, parameters of the economy will impact steady state inflation. For example, an increase in the labor wedge ends up leading you to a world with higher dispersion and higher inflation. A decrease in the elasticity of substitution uh, will, will, will do uh, the same. Okay? We sort of think about this as, you know, which is what we write about in our, old, in our other paper, loosely as like a deglobalization uh, shock of some sort okay, that, uh, that uh, can increase monopoly power and that's going to, or flex price monopoly power, which is going to lead you to more inflation. So let me give you a little bit of intuition for this. Uh, take as a benchmark uh, an economy where the taxes, the payroll taxes are chosen perfectly to offset all monopoly distortions, okay? This is an economy where the best thing to do is also the one that would coincide with no commitment, which is zero inflation. So now let's just say that we increase uh, uh, distortions by epsilon. Well, if we had a perfect inflation targeting, then the economy would maintain zero inflation and the economy would immediately jump to a uh, lower labor share, higher markup economy. That's what would happen, okay, if you had perfect commitment. Now, we don't have perfect commitment, okay? The central bank, uh, this is not incentive compatible for the central bank. If, if, you know, if firms were uh, naive, uh, the central bank would say, terrific, I'm gonna stimulate. Well, the firms are not naive. Flex price firms anticipate that the central bank is going to respond to this with greater stimulus, so then they're gonna raise their prices. They're, the flex price firms today will do it, the flex price firms tomorrow will keep doing it, so you're gonna get these sequential price increases that are gonna gradually increase dispersion along the way, okay? As they increase dispersion along the way, the incentives uh, for the central bank to keep stimulating are going to dissipate, and eventually you're gonna land on a, uh, on a, a higher inflation steady state. Okay, that's result number one. Uh, result number two is that, uh, um, you don't have to read this, but the result number two is that a transition to the new steady state uh, involves overshooting of inflation, okay? So as we go from a low inflation steady state to a high inflation steady state, um, inflation uh, overshoots. We prove this with a uh, three-dimensional nonlinear system, so it's complicated, but what's, uh, so, but, but, but we can kind of do this uh, in a phase diagram and we can do it exactly in a special case, which, is, which I can show you with, the, with a phase diagram, where you can write the, the D dot locus, the pi dot locus, you can write a, uh, you, you have a, uh, uh, the, the stable arm there, and what you can show is that if you shift to, let's say you increase monopoly power by uh, shifting the, uh, the, the, the Phillips curve, which the nonlinear Phillips curve, which is one of the lo loci here, the pi dot locus, you end up having inflation overshoot and it converges back down. Uh, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna give you an intuition for this versus going through the math. The intuition for this is, is as follows, okay? Um, when, the, when you have a shock, okay, a permanent, this is a permanent MIT shock, so you have a permanent change in the economy that increases monopoly power. Uh, everyone recognizes that the central bank is going to stimulate, and so the flex price firms will increase their prices by a lot. So you're going to have a lot of inflation at first. As we go along, dispersion is going to keep rising. Okay, so as dispersion rises, real wages uh, are, are going to, to fall. And uh, as real wages fall, the incentive for future firm price increases will, will diminish. So that's why the largest price increases will happen at the very beginning of the transition, but then they're gonna gradually go down later into the transition. But you're, and then you'll, that's why you're gonna overshoot in inflation on your way to a uh, new steady state. What I'll do uh, to, uh, and, and, and I just, maybe I should just say that part of what we do in the Brookings paper is do a log linear uh, approximation around a special case. Uh, 
Um, maybe I should advertise this. If you look at the special case as sigma, the elasticity of substitution goes to one. We solve this exactly, which is pretty cool. You can show the exact system of equations, solve it by hand. And anyway, so that's just a little thing for you, just for fun. Uh, so then the, the, uh, uh, the last thing I'm going to show you is just to tell you a story. Forget about the numbers, because this is not a quantitative paper. This is more to illustrate how, this res how the responses look, to inspect the mechanism. So this is like an unanticipated increase uh, in, in the labor wedge. Same thing happens with the, an unanticipated decrease in the elasticity of substitution. So naturally, we're going to go to a higher inflation steady state. What happens along the way? Well, clearly, in the top left, you see that price dispersion is going to gradually increase. Output's going to gradually decrease. So la labor here is, is fixed. Nothing's happening to, to labor. But output is decreasing because price dispersion is going down. Um, Price inflation, you see the overshooting there. Inflation goes up at the beginning and then gradually goes back down. The nominal rate jumps up and then gradually lands on a, at a higher level. So you kind of get a Fisherian effect, a long run Fisherian effect that, that shows up here because you're, you're moving to a higher inflation, higher nominal interest rate uh, steady state. The real rate declines at the, at the very beginning because uh, uh, the central bank is uh, sort of partly accommodating the shock. and. Uh, and then, it, and then interestingly, you have, you have wage inflation uh, jump and then rise up, but, because, but you have a real wage decrease, long run real wage decrease. Um, so the net, total net increase in wages is actually behind the total net increase in prices. Um, and then we kind of show that you know, the value of commitment can be large. The last thing I will say is that there is something interesting that emerges here is that the sensitivity of long-run inflation to even tiny little changes in the environment is extraordinarily high. And that is related to the fact that firms are extremely forward-looking in the standard baseline uh, calibration of the, of, of the Calvo model. That's related to other observations in the literature. In conclusion, uh, what do we do here? We basically look at you know, how to analyze lack of commitment in the nonlinear New Keynesian model. That gives you uh, long-run implications, long-run transition dynamics. I didn't spend too much on this, but in the sister paper we wrote, I'm sorry, I'm in negative, uh, negative uh, territory here for minutes. In the sister paper we wrote, uh, we spent some time saying that glo uh, inflation globally declined over the past 30 years, not just because of the beauty of central bank independence, though of course we all believe that that's very important, but because the job of central bankers was made a lot easier by various different uh, things like uh, globalization, Washington consensus, and, and you know, fiscal prudence, at least in emerging markets. And we believe that moving forward, the job of central bankers will become incrementally harder because of the reversal of some of these things. So that's what we use the framework to say. And, um, and, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Pierre. We really need somebody um, to dissect this uh, difficult model from us. And, and who is better prepared to dissect this uh, set of equations than Albert Marseille from Barcelona, um, who is uh, uh, the research chair for macroeconomic risk at the Barcelona School of Economics. Hi. So um, thanks for having me <clears throat> in the conference. I had to spend quite a lot of time in the ECB like 20 years ago, but uh, I haven't been lately, so it's really nice to be back and see many people I have met over the years. I'm not going to dissect the paper. OK, so the first thing I was going to say is I've never written a paper on sticky prices, so um, uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot do that. So. <laughs> um, I'm, so I'm not uh, an expert on that. Uh, I'm going to try to use the chance that, um, f that I was invited, and I took it, so <laughs> to, to, to relate what uh, Pierre and co-authors have done to uh, a, a few issues that I think are important and that matter, and uh, how I see <clears throat> uh, the usefulness of this paper. So first of all, it's a great paper. I'm very sympathetic to the idea that uh, we should address nonlinearities and transitions to steady state. Um, uh, it's OK to, I mean, I also do linear approximations if, uh, I, if they simplify the analysis. But I think the profession is uh, 
kind of forgetting that these are approximations, okay? <laughs> and they could be quite bad. And we have more and more papers uh, pointing this out, and I think this is a very good, um, a very good um, uh, contribution in that sense because it's furthering that <coughs> that um, that view. Also, it's the profession focuses on long run steady state results, especially for policy and for many things. And I think the profession also forgot that <coughs> the steady state is something that could take uh, many, many, many years, and it's perhaps irrelevant in order to decide what we should be doing now. So, in that sense, <coughs> the, um, uh, I'm totally sympathetic to this, and I think just because they do this and they do it so carefully and they are so, uh, uh, they, do, they don't take any shortcuts, uh, I think that's a great paper. I also like it because it uh, talks about uh, an issue I'm, we are working on, uh, which is trying to reconsider um, uh, issues of time inconsistency. They point out, because they solve the two models exactly, they can point out that something we've seen in other papers, but they, they, can, they show us now that the costs of no commitment are very large, or can be very large in, in this model, okay? So the, the full commitment welfare is much larger than the no commitment. So I would like to take this chance to, to, to talk about uh, the last thing, about issues of time inconsistency and about uh, transitions and uh, about another thing that I would like to see, perhaps in the next paper, not, I'm not a fan of huge papers, so maybe the next paper, would be interesting to see how this works on a heterogeneous agent model. And I think there's here uh, a lot to do and very little that has been done. There's a lot to do on optimal policy with heterogeneous agents. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we're doing and relate it to, to what they have done. Um, so let me talk about this paper which was just published. Uh, it's basically a Chamley model with heterogeneous agents. Okay, so there's capital taxes, labor taxes, government, uh, government um, can save and, and issue bonds, and um, price, prices are flexible. The only in unimaginative uh, um, thing we added is uh, heterogeneous agents. Uh, there's one agent that has a lot of capital income and another that has much less capital income. There are two. We calibrate it to the economy. Um, we know that there's uh, this uh, long run, zero capital taxes, zero optimal capital taxes in the long run, uh, which Straub and Werning have uh, kind of revived, and um, they show cases where it doesn't work, but in, still in most cases it works, and in our model it works, that capital taxes should be zero in the long run. And basically what we have, uh, let me skip this, what we have then is the, I'm going to use the pointer so the people here don't see the pointer, but it's, what we have is the following. Let's say zero is uh, normalizing the welfare of the two agents, okay? So zero is uh, normalizing to a benchmark, which is the current capital labor taxes, okay? And this is a Pareto optimal frontier, which is something that we teach undergraduates, but we don't use very much in macro, okay? Uh, and we, I think we should go back to these frontiers just as we teach them in intermediate micro. This is what happens in the model I just showed you. What happens is if you, uh, if you do something like what you would think is the Chambly result, I'm gonna take more, more time, you're kind of way over here. You really screw the workers, okay? If you do what's optimal for a homogeneous agent model, you screw the workers a lot. It's kind of obvious, <laughs> unless you've been doing Chamley models all, all your life, because uh, you, know, you lower capital taxes too quickly, workers lose. If you constrain yourself to Pareto improving solutions, that's the solid blue line, 
okay, Pareto improvement above zero for both, then you could do that. But what you have to do is to have a much longer transition. Uh, you, yes, you have zero capital taxes in the long run. We, we want a model that has that to point out that there still is a redistributive issue. And that in order to make the workers accept a capital tax cut, uh, you have to tax capital for a much longer time. Okay, so as we move this way to, to the right, as we move to the right of the Pareto Optimal Frontier, we, uh, we need to tax longer and longer and longer capital. And then, yeah, we reach a second best uh, optimum, uh, far from the lump sum tax redistributive, which is the black line. Is that clear? So, and by the way, the psi is the weight of the second agent, of one of the agents, it doesn't matter. So one, Psi 1, is what almost all the papers in macro doing uh, optimal policy do, which is we give the same weight to everybody. But that's silly. We tell, we tell undergraduates not to do that, not to do intertemporal utility comparisons. Uh, what we should be doing is look at the Pareto frontier. The, the welfare weights are just um, a mathematical trick to get over the frontier. And, uh, well, if we do psi equals 1, we don't get a Pareto improvement, okay? Uh, in the, with this calibration, we calibrate everything. So where this speaks to the current paper is, well, then this is the whole uh, optimal taxes. The different lines are different points on the Pareto improving region. And uh, the time is years, so it takes 20 years of very high capital taxes and 20 years of low labor taxes to get to the optimum. Okay, so this is another example how the transition matters. If we just look at long run results, uh, it, they don't tell us what we should be doing for the next 20 years according to this model, which is the opposite, okay? Um, so this is another example of how looking at long run results may be very misleading and why I like the, this paper. But there is another issue that relates, uh, that we, we, are, we don't have a paper, we're working on this, uh, but it's the following issue. Let's look at timing consistency in this model I talked about, or in many, uh, in mo in, in many other macro models, okay? I'll, if I have time, I'll talk quickly about a macro mo a monetary model. <laughs> where the same issue arises. Why, why did we, for about 50 years, think of timing cons uh, of full commitment policies as not sustainable? Okay. Um, wh I mean, I don't remember what Ed and Finn wrote, actually, because I read their paper so long ago, but I think that what, what the profession thinks is there's kind of two issues that are related. One is if the government reoptimizes a full commitment policy in the future, it will want to change it. This is kind of what almost literally, the first bullet point is almost literally what Sargent and Jungquist wrote, uh, and uh, it's one way to write it. But kind of following that is that everybody will agree to a change in policy, okay? So how can you promise a policy that everybody will say this is not a good idea? And it's kind of what, is the same as what in game theory they call not being renegotiation proof. No? There's a long uh, tradition in, in, um, in game theory where, you know, if all the parties that wrote a contract agree to change it, you will not write it to begin with. Now, in the model that I wrote, uh, what would happen if you reconsider, okay, if you, in the Chamley heterogeneous agent model, what happens if in period, period five, Q, equal, Q is the period where you would reconsider? What would happen if you reconsider and you say, well, I promise to do this, but what happens is that this is the Pareto optimal frontier 
in period five, okay, and this is the value of the continuation. The continuation is Pareto optimal, okay? It is still, but it must be, wait a minute, I know it's time inconsistent, right? And yes, it is time inconsistent if you keep a weight of one, of one, okay? If you start with a weight of one, and in period five, you consider, do I want to re-optimize with a weight of one? Then it's true, that would be the point. That's what you would do, you, you would have a different welfare and a different policy. But it's not true that everybody would agree to it. And not only that, you, you would not be able to get uh, approval for any policy that needs 50.5% of the votes. Uh, okay? This is true in our model. I think it's true in many other models. Uh, it's not true in every model that, of full, full commitment, but it is something that I think is, you know, we, we I, th I think it's important when we talk about commitment of monetary policy, okay? And we think of it, no, no, we're really, we're really tough and really, you know, hard-nosed and so, but it doesn't matter how hard-nosed you are, you know, uh, at some point the, bar the Bank of Argentina was hard-nosed and they were just brought down by the government, you know. So, uh, they, you know, the Bank of Argentina wanted to not use the currency reserves and the the government said we would like to spend them, and they did. <laughs> they just uh... so. In order to think about commitment, what's sustainable, what's not, I think we need to not bring back heterogeneity in models of optimal policy, and to think about how we resolve this conflict. You know what what happens is that there's going to be a social conflict, which point on the frontier we might want to re-optimize to. And we need to bring in our models that, uh, what, what it is that we would do if we would reconsider. So very quickly, I don't have the time to do, uh, but uh, think of a monetary model. Um, this is the ECB, so I thought just before coming here, I would write a monetary model. Um, same issue would arise in a kind of older, uh, I mean, before Jordi, um, Money, money model, where you have uh, money in the utility function, flexible prices, uh, nominal bonds, okay, and uh, there are uh, taxes. So there is labor taxes. We know that in this model, the budget constraint um, is like this: uh, the discounted budget constraint. The government can complete the markets actually. The budget constraint is such that the government wants to inflate as much as possible in the first period, right? And depreciate the value of bonds, okay? So since I have 30 seconds, let me, well, we'll uh, uh, that's an, an, and a homogeneous agent would be very happy with that, with a government that promises to have a high inflation in the first period and promises to never do it again. Now, think what happens if you have two agents one has a lot of bonds and the other doesn't. <laughs> uh, it's not true that they will agree to do it again. So there is no time inconsistency again. Okay. So that's uh, zero. I was really good actually at this. <laughs> so that's all. A uh, great paper and um, made me think about a lot of issues. Albert really had his last breath that went before the thing turned red, so that was quite a, an achievement. <laughs> um, while the audience gathers its thoughts for the, any questions you may have, maybe you, if you have anything to add to, sure. I was about to say to dissect uh, Albert's new paper he's working on, but uh, <laughs> sure, he yeah. will probably not do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, maybe I'll just say thank you. I appreciate very much the, the, the comments, very thought provoking. I thought just uh, in terms of, there is an analogy of course to the capital tax result in the sense that the optimal capital tax is zero in the long run. Here, the optimal inflation rate is zero in the long run, but then there's an issue about the ability to commit to that. Uh, one key difference is that relative to capital taxes is that you've got this, you're carrying, everything is happening with this dispersion thing that's moving around over time, the, the analog uh, 
to that in the, in the capital tax result uh, economy doesn't quite exist. Um, there is uh, buried in here is a distributional conflict that we don't take care of, that we don't really explicitly look at because it's a unitary agent. But as you suggested, there's capitalists or there's firm owners and workers. And one thing that's going on in the model is that uh, a byproduct of low inflation, which is what you'd like to commit to, is higher markups. And so what happens in this economy is a, de a rapid decline in inflation is going to re result in higher equilibrium markups. Uh, so, and so the question is, who's going to dislike that? Who's going to like that if you had a heterogeneous agent economy? I'll, uh, I will mention just a little plug for um, Andreas Schaub, who's, uh, 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 who, who's an extremely prolific uh, young uh, assistant professor now at Berkeley who, who has some work on no commitment in a monetary model, um, uh, it, but he's got Rotenberg pricing, and so he's sort of thought about some of these distributional issues as well. So that's, that's what I'll say. Okay, yeah. very good. I saw I had already three questions. Uh, we start with Jordi Gali. Uh, Barcelona is counting a second time. Uh, otherwise, you please state your name and affiliation before you speak, but I hear I have already done that. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you. Very nice paper. Um, I have two comments. Um, First, uh, well, as you know, one can do um, your analysis using the linearized model around the zero inflation steady state under the assumption that you know, the re resulting new steady state will not be too far from, from zero. And one can derive an analytical expression for the steady state inflation under the equilibrium, uh, under optimal policy without commitment. So I think it would be useful um, to get a sense of the extent to which that approximation is good or not. Okay, so to play with a couple of parameters, you know, the, and, and, and see to what extent the implied <coughs> steady state inflations are very different or not. Of course, the, the, the linearized model doesn't have a, a transitional dynamics. Right. Right. Okay, so that's clearly a, a, an interesting insight from, from using the nonlinear model. Um, and and the, the comment, uh, my second comment has to do with um, the, the interpretation you gave at the end of you know, recent developments and inflation through the lens of your model. And I kind of disagree um, with that in the sense that, well, of course, you want to, to give up, like, you have your model to, to provide the positive theory of inflation. But I think one may reinterpret what has happened in a different way. We have um, plenty of evidence by Jan and co-authors that uh, this in inefficiency wedge may have increased, in particular because markups have increased. So if anything, that would have led to, uh, on, you know, and under discretion, to higher inflation. We haven't seen that. We, if anything, we have seen the opposite. So when, um, but at the same time, we have seen more and more central banks around the world to adopt inflation targeting policies with the explicit inflation targets. So one may reinterpret this as an attempt by central banks to somewhat commit themselves, of course, they don't do the optimal policy with commitment, but to commit themselves to a steady state inflation, given that the temptation to, you know, to inflate has been increasing because of the increasing wedges. So that's just yeah, a, a reinterpretation sure. of. So let me, can I? Add, yeah. yeah, let's go, but we need to be a bit shorter be very because short. I uh, saw many questions. I, I, I'm won't, sure fill a, I won't filibuster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, we did the linearized comparison. The linearized model would give you way too much uh, impact of commitment. So the, the fact that it's, you do the full, the nonlinear thing, um, you don't ha have as much of a reaction. That's because of the dispersion in there. That sort of limits the commitment problem. So that's kind of the short answer. The, the other one is um, I think that you can have multiple different forces going on that affect central banking. And so you could have some forces that cause markups to go up, but then you have other forces that cause them. Um, um, you know, it's about the flex price markup. It's not about the equilibrium markup. So that's, that's what, now what we do suggest in the paper is that if central banks become more hawkish, which we definitely agree is part of the explanation for why inflation went down, you will get higher equilibrium markups. So that is consistent with, with what we see. It's just different reason why you get higher equilibrium markups. Okay, uh, there was Dimitri and then there's Stein, I believe, yeah. Hi, uh, Dmitry Sergeyev, Bocconi University. Uh, thanks, Pierre, great presentation. So I have two questions. First, um, so you think of commitment problem as arising from presence of this uh, 
uh, markup distortion. Uh, another distortion that uh, people kind of uh, talk about a lot when think about uh, inflation target is the presence of the ZOB uh, and the, the fact that central banks hit ZOB from time to time. So uh, I'm sure you have thought about this problem. So uh, I, I wonder what, whether uh, you have something to say about uh, uh, that. And uh, second, uh, you solve uh, a game between the central bank uh, and the rest of the agents of the economy. Uh, but uh, so uh, mirroring a little bit what George said, um, central banks try to commit. And one of the approaches that people used in this old literature that you cited is optimal contract uh, approach to, or optimal contract design approach to uh, inflation targeting. So uh, if you consider that, what would be outcome in your environment in that right. case? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so, uh, you know, the ZLB is really, the commitment there has to do with a, in a world where you'll eventually exit it and you have to promise to do certain things later, right? So we have nothing to say about that here because we not don't have shocks. The one thing I will say without doing the exact model is I think about the ZLB as a commitment to be more hawkish. So that's kind of how I think about it. So the ZLB, if anything, is, is a force for preventing the central bank from caving into the temptation to stimulate in an average sense. So that, that's how I, I would think about it. And I can write little models to sort of show that we, we've done that. Uh, I've worked on uh, the optimal contract design approach. I have another paper with Marina Halleck on instruments versus targets, sort of thinking about that issue. And actually, I, you know, I'll plug Andreas Schaub has another nice paper, which I believe is forthcoming in AER, that's also thinking about this optimal contract approach in a dynamic New Keynesian model. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, I, I've definitely thought about that. We, we didn't do it here uh, specifically, but it would be interesting to think about. Okay, I think next was Stein. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much, Stein Klaassen. My, my question was more translating that to the policy environment in terms of the mandate and the communication central banks does. Uh, so does your paper, because it gets difficult, right, to think of this uh, commitment and how to translate that, particularly if you have heterogeneous agents, in terms of the dual mandate, is that a proxy you can think of of achieving what you have in mind? Uh, and then second related question is on the recent reviews of monetary policy frameworks, uh, which have more of an asymmetry component to it in the US and even in here at the ECB, um, thinking more the ZLB, uh, but beyond that also think on, on the distributional impact. Um, uh, to answer this question, I'm gonna answer in a way that gives you my personal opinion. I can't, I can't claim to represent what my three other uh, co-authors believe. I think the one thing you learned from this is that there is no such thing as the natural rate of output. The natural rate of output is the one that is consistent with the inflation target. Okay, so that's what happens in this framework. You give me an inflation target, you give me a natural rate of output. So if I wanted to give you my two cents about what I think should happen in the strategic review, is it should be very clear that you know this def definition of what the you know empl maximal employment is. It is not this thing that drops from the sky. It is this object that is consistent with the inflation target. So that's like a very sp different way of thinking about, uh, about maximal output. And I think that's consistent with the framework. I'm afraid you're going to see a central banker with limited commitment because even though I'm red, I want to take a few more questions because I like this discussion. So could those who still have a question quickly show? So, okay, I have Guido and I have Anton was, I believe, first. So I still take you two and then we move to yeah. the other paper. So please try to be concise, given my commitment Hi, problem. Anton Nack of ECB. Thanks a lot for a great uh, presentation. I have uh, two suggestions for extensions or questions. How would your results be affected? One is if you had uh, large idiosyncratic shocks in the Cabo framework, not as, you know, keeping the Cabo theory, I think then uh, price dispersion would be uh, moved mostly by these idiosyncratic shocks and the dynamics can change quite a bit. And the second is, of course, if you had uh, state dependent pricing that it could be inflation decreases price dispersion. So again, things could change there in terms of the final result you obtain for the optimal inflation rate. Thank you. Go ahead and I'll take Maybe I'll take another one and I'll okay, do the let's two, let's, we'll do the two at once. Guido Scari, University uh, of Pavia and the MBA. So, uh, no, I, have, I would have many points, but uh, I have to cut. So one uh, would be, uh, you know, there, there's a young old paper in the AR which does something similar. So I uh, just wanted to know what's, 
it's, it's a great paper. I think it's a very important topic. Uh, the other thing is, I think if you have indexation, basically you have no price dispersion, or it's very little, and all the problem washes away. The, the price setting also matters a lot. If you have Rottenberg, for example, uh, results quantitatively at least would be very different. There's a literature on you know the cost of trend inflation that um, I think I wrote a few papers about. And uh, that explained the point by Jordi. Uh, actually, the log linear model around zero inflation is a very bad model. It's a very bad log linear rising uh, approximation for the nonlinear Calvo model as it is. And that's why you get that uh, the results are very sensitive to very change of parameters, because that's in that very point that the model nonlinear is exactly. So you may want to look at this, uh, at this literature, too. Absolutely. Let's, let's talk some more after that. I will just say that as you approach as you approach flex pricing, commitment lack of commitment becomes even more of a problem because it's a, it's a race between the firms and the government, and so the, it becomes a much worse situation. Uh, the, the previous question about idiosyncratic, we, we haven't solved it, but I think the way you want to think about uh, about dispersion here is dispersion relative to the flex price dispersion, right? So it's misallocation relative to the misallocation that is efficient misallocation. Um, that, that's kind of the relevant quantity that, uh, that we, we are looking at. I think that we have it. Thank you very much. Maybe another round of applause. For the team. <laughs> so, uh, we make a huge leap uh, to, the, to the data and to the secular decline of, cent of uh, bank balance sheet balance sheets. So Amit Zero is a professor of finance at the business school in Stanford and uh, 25 minutes is your time. Thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, giving me an opportunity to present this paper. This is joint work with uh, uh, Greg Buchak, my colleague at Stanford, Gregor Matos at Northwestern and Tomek Piskorski at in Columbia. Uh, so the motivation for the paper is pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Banks are considered pretty central uh, for lending in many policy debates. Most recently, you would have all seen in the Basel III discussions, this was the uh, pretext of uh, the debate there that uh, banks are central and any shocks, adverse shocks to bank uh, will lead to a, a major change in lending. Uh, why is this uh, the view? Because the bank balance sheet view sort of says that uh, banks are basically important for channeling uh, resources from uh, savers through deposits to the users or the borrowers. And uh, implicitly, if uh, there are bad effects of regulation on lending, if uh, uh, you don't have uh, many substitutes available. Uh, so that's something that uh, is implicit in the bank balance sheet view. And uh, in our prior work, we have sort of tried to look at this in the context of uh, mortgage market and other consumer markets and try to understand whether this assumption is reasonable, uh, what happens, how special are bank inter uh, intermediaries. And in this paper, what we do is take a more broader view beyond just the mortgage market and ask the same question. Uh, essentially, what we are after is that do shocks to bank balance sheet lending affect aggregate lending? And as you're answering that, uh, you want to sort of think about, are there substitutes in non-bank sector? Uh, if you take a very extreme view, you can think about full decoupling between banks and non-banks, and uh, that would say that shocks uh, uh, to bank sector doesn't really affect if the substitutes are pretty good. So that's one extreme view. You also want to understand probably that are banks potentially complements to non-bank lending? So the other extreme view here would be that if uh, we are bank-centric, and for every dollar of non-bank lending, if banks are important, uh, you want to sort of, uh, shocks to the bank balance sheet are still going to be pretty important. So that's a quantitative question, and uh, we want to understand this in the context of banks, uh, like I said, in the broader context. So that's what this paper tries to do, tries to understand this in the US context in the last 60 years. Uh, there are two parts to the paper, uh, I'll touch briefly on both parts, but uh, you'll have to read the paper because I have 22 minutes. Uh, so the first part is just documenting facts, uh, which are going to be quite critical to answering this question. And then the second part is going to take those facts and put it in a quantitative model. So let me just briefly tell you uh, 
uh, what we do on these parts uh, uh, so that you have a sense of what's inside the paper. Uh, so when it comes to facts, uh, the main sort of fact that we are going to be sort of focused on is that there is a big decline in bank balance sheet lending in the US since 1960s. Uh, so the first fact I'm going to show you on the lending side, and uh, if you consider bank balance sheet lending as informationally sensitive, at least relative to non-banks or originate to distribute, uh, what we show is that there is a pretty dramatic change here. And this is across all major segments, not just mortgages or consumer credit. It's pretty much everywhere. And you'll see what I mean in a second. Uh, similarly, on the saver side, uh, what you see is that there is a decline in uh, deposit as a share of savings from the uh, savings sector. And both of these things uh, uh, together are going to inform us about uh, uh, potential substitution of banks to non-banks. Uh, then we are going to sort of spend some time talking about the third fact, which is uh, the bank balance sheet itself has seen a pretty dramatic shift from uh, loans to securities. And that sort of uh, uh, tells you a little bit about what are the interlinkages between bank balance sheet and non-banks. And the idea being that there is more of an interconnection now than before. In the paper, we sort of spend some time talking also about, besides aggregate trends, focusing on some micro evidence, which kind of tries to pinpoint these things a little bit. So for example, securitization technology and what it does. Uh, similarly, on saver preferences, when there's an increase in shadow money, what does that mean in terms of bank balance sheet lending? And uh, similarly, when you look at banks itself, the effect of regulation and subsidies on banks' balance sheet. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on these things, but they are in the paper. Uh, what I'm going to sort of spend some time on is when we look at these facts and we try to interpret them, of course, you can think about uh, banks and non-bank linkages between full decoupling that I told you before and a bank-centric view. And ultimately, it's a quantitative question where we are. The real world is going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, so we are going to develop in the second part a quantitative model of intermediation. Uh, what does it have? It has pretty standard pieces. Uh, one is there's going to be a saving sector. Uh, there is going to be a borrowing sector. Uh, and there is going to be financial intermediaries channeling uh, the resources from one sector to the other. Uh, there's going to be banks and non-banks uh, in this intermediation sector. Uh, as I'll illustrate in some detail, uh, banks are going to be issuing uh, deposits to make informationally sensitive loans. And they're going to manage their balance sheet through securities and so on. Uh, non-banks are going to issue debt securities and make informationally insensitive loans. Uh, the interlinkages are going to be important because we'll allow the uh, data to tell us how important these are. So in the interlinkages, banks can act both as a substitute and as a complement. They purchase securities and also do some joint productions. For example, when you do CLOs, you can imagine banks and non-banks uh, operating together. Uh, once we have this quantitative model done, uh, the idea is to sort of look at these macro trends that I spoke to you about before and decompose those into borrower-driven shifts. So these are going to be uh, shifts in demand curve for bank loans versus non-bank loans. Uh, Saver-driven shifts, which is going to be demand curve uh, shifts uh, for deposits versus other saving uh, uh, technologies. And uh, bank-driven costs or subsidies, uh, depending on regulation and other shifts that have happened. And in case I don't finish, uh, the model allows us to do two kinds of exercises. Uh, uh, one is when I look at the main uh, aggregate trends, it allows us to decompose these things. And we find that if you look at borrower demand shifts, uh, they explain quite well aggregate lending quantities and composition of bank versus non-bank. When you look at saver demand shifts, uh, they, they explain very well uh, the bank balance sheet size. And if you look at the regulatory changes which affect the bank costs th themselves, they affect the bank balance sheet composition. Uh, that's one piece of the model uh, that, that, the, that the model does. And the second piece is we can do counterfactuals, like in, if you imposed high capital requirements, remember the debate on Basel III, uh, what do you see? Uh, well, we find that the, there's a large impact on composition on the bank balance sheet, uh, but small effect in aggregate lending. And uh, just as a preview, why is that the case? Because non-bank lending turns out to be a good substitute in the data. Uh, 
And uh, when banks are adjusting, they actually adjust on the margin of securities by selling securities before they actually contract lending. So in some sense, you can think about this as uh, MM in aggregate uh, due to substitutes available for bank balance sheet lending. Okay, so let me get into some more details. Uh, what's the data? Uh, at the aggregate level, we are going to look, look at flow of funds uh, uh, in the data, and uh, one of the series is going to be total lending. That's outstanding uh, debt of households and uh, non-financial businesses. This series uh, from 60s till now goes from about a trillion to uh, 40 trillion. Uh, we'll be interested in two segments. Uh, one segment is going to be the bank balance sheet lending segment, which is called informationally sensitive in the banking literature. Why? Because banks screen and monitor. Uh, so there's a qualitative assumption that banks are special. Quantitatively, the data will tell us how, how much. Over time, uh, uh, you know, the most current in 2023, out of 38, 40 trillion of total lending, this is about a third. Uh, the rest is uh, debt securities. So this is total lending minus whatever is informationally sensitive. And there are many pieces here. There is government-backed debt securities. There is private debt securities. Uh, uh, if you look at debt securities, that's two-thirds of 38 trillion in 2023. Uh, private debt securities account for about 60%. Government affiliated about 40%. So when you think about GSCs, they are in here, but they are not all of it. So just to fix ideas, as I show you the uh, data and the facts, uh, it's useful to sort of talk about the map of the flow of funds. Uh, so here is how you should think about what I'm going to show you and how the economy fits together. There are going to be borrowers who are going to receive loans from banks and non-banks. Uh, banks are going to make these sensitive loans uh, and are also going to have uh, securities and other assets on the asset side. They're going to fund themselves through uh, deposits and equity. Uh, uh, which is going to be on the uh, uh, financed by savers. Uh, there is also going to be a non-bank uh, originate to di distribute sector, which is going to finance the insensitive loans. They are going to be funded by uh, loans from banks, as well as uh, securities, which are owned both by banks and the uh, uh, saving sector. So as I show you facts, they'll fit somewhere in this map, and I'll tell you a little bit uh, briefly where they fit in. So here is the first fact that I talked about. So bank balance sheet lending as a share of total lending uh, has fallen from 55% in mid-60s, early 70s, uh, to about 33%. And over this time period, uh, if you're wondering, there were a bunch of changes that happened, including uh, securitization and development of technology related to credit scoring and so on, which kind of you can think about as making non-bank sector a little bit more competitive relative to banking sector. These uh, patterns are not just in mortgages. For example, on the left, they are also in non-mortgage sector. On the right-hand side, you can decompose it in different ways, business and consumer credit. You see these patterns everywhere. The numbers might not go from 55 to 30 percent, but there is a secular decline in bank balance sheet lending uh, everywhere. The second fact that uh, I sort of mentioned before is on the saver side. So what is this? Uh, deposits as a fraction of financial wealth uh, of the domestic uh, non-financial sector goes down from 20% to 13%. Remember that deposits as a grow share of GDP goes up during this time period. So that tells you financial wealth as a uh, fraction of GDP is growing even faster. Uh, so what happened here? A uh, bunch of other changes as well, like money market fund reforms, pension fund reforms, and so on. <clears throat> the third fact relates to the composition of the bank balance sheet. And here I sort of mentioned before that the loan share of bank assets falls from 70% to 55%. And what happened here, which might have led this, many things potentially, including regulation, most recently the Dodd-Frank. And concurrently, as uh, the loan share of bank assets has fallen, it's not like banks are not doing anything. Uh, they are actually investing more in securities. Now remember, securities fund non-bank sector, so banks are implicitly going to be interlinked with non-bank sector. They also directly lend to non-bank sector on the right-hand side, and you can see that <coughs> that proportion has uh, uh, remained stable and kind of gone up over time. So back to the map that I showed you before, uh, 
you can see that these facts actually tie to different pieces in the intermediation map that I showed you and the flow of funds. So for example, when I sort of talked about bank balance sheet uh, uh, lending share, that's really talking about the liabilities of the borrowing sector. Uh, when I talked about the uh, deposit share, that's talking about the asset side of the saver sector. When I talked about the bank lending uh, loan share falling, that's really about the asset side of the intermediation sector, the banks. And then when I talked about the uh, bank share of uh, uh, non-bank liabilities, that's really talking about the liabilities of the non-bank sector. So these are the facts, and like I told you already, that uh, we, we have a bunch of micro-evidence in the paper, which kind of gets at trying to nail these uh, mechanisms down, but I'm not going to talk much about it. If you're interested, we look at, for example, shocks to securitization and see what happens to the amount of loans banks make, uh, what happens to the security exposure they have. Similarly, as shadow bank money share increases, we ask how much of that explains financing of private credit. And as regulation has changed over uh, this time series, we asked what role does it play in terms of uh, bank loan share. Uh, but I'm going to skip that. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the quantitative model. Remember, the quantitative model is trying to do a couple of things. Uh, very briefly, I have already mentioned there are three sectors in here. And uh, what is important to note here is that we are trying to fit uh, long sort of secular trends. We are not going to be doing something which is at a uh, very micro frequency. So we are not going to be interested in dynamics. So you can think about these as static cross sections, really, that what we are doing. And there are a bunch of very important things, uh, including things that were discussed in the earlier paper that we are not focused on. For example, the risk-free rate is given exogenously. Uh, we are going to allow a bunch of things, though, in a very serious way related to intermediation, uh, where we allow deviations from MM, uh, but let the data tell us how or, uh, important they might be. So for example, deposits can be special. There could be a deposit franchise. Similarly, banks can be special in lending, uh, and better capitalized banks could be more productive, and so on. But you know, these are things that we uh, 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 allow, but we don't impose. Uh, let, we let the data uh, tell us. Uh, so back to the map, uh, what's going to be, go be going on in the model? So on the borrower uh, sector side, there's going to be a demand for uh, borrowing products. Uh, you can think about the demand for sensitive and insensitive loans, the micro foundation being that some projects require banks for screening and monitoring versus others. This is going to allow us to extract borrower demand shifters, really. Similarly, on the saver side, you can think about uh, uh, demand for saving products. So there could be demand for deposits for liquidity, and there could be other uh, demand related diversification and so on. Essentially, that side is going to allow us to extract uh, saver demand shifters. And then the big piece is going to be the intermediary sector, uh, which we allow uh, 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 the banks to be, uh, to have, uh, the sector to have monopolistic competition so that banks can have rents as they issue loans and deposits. And uh, we also allow interlinkages between assets and liability side because that gets to the various theories of banking out there. Uh, so for example, capital uh, allows you to affect lending efficiency potentially. Liquidity, which is securities that you have, uh, allows you to potentially uh, affect your uh, deposit issuance costs. And the idea here is to extract these bank regulatory costs uh, through this uh, uh, middle uh, piece uh, out there. Uh, in addition, like I've already mentioned, that bank balance sheets and uh, non-banks are connected because banks can own securities and there is a joint production which is allowed as well where banks can directly invest in the non-bank sector. So think about, for example, CLOs where banks are essential to uh, actual intermediation. Now very briefly in terms of uh, talking about how the model uh, is estimated or calibrated. Uh, there are going to be two pieces which I want to just emphasize. One is, uh, as we sort of talk about uh, uh, the bank side, uh, the bank first order condition is going to imply that there's a relation between a bunch of observed returns, so returns on loans, returns on deposits, returns on equity, and bank balance sheet variables. Uh, so both the returns and balance sheet variables are observable in data, so we can use GMM to recover the parameters. Uh, we sort of recover elasticities uh, 
uh, uh, for the borrower and saver side, uh, which are in line with the literature. A couple of other comments which tells us that what we are doing is not completely crazy uh, is that when you look at deposits, uh, they are cheaper to provide when bank has more uh, liquid securities and similarly uh, loans have a higher return when bank is well capitalized, which again is in line with what people have found, so it's not completely crazy. Uh, the second piece here, which I think I just wanted to mention briefly uh, related to the estimation, is the normalization that we do. Uh, uh, the saver demand is going to be measured relative to deposits. So when I show you anything, it's measured relative to deposits. The borrower demand is going to be measured relative to informationally sensitive loans because they are normalized to one. And the proportion of sensitive to insensitive projects are uh, estimated once because you know, we cannot estimate uh, that as well as other parameters uh, which are varying over time. So when we allow the other parameters to vary over time, we can look at the data and see what we are finding and map it to the facts and trends that I showed you before. And essentially, we don't think what we are finding is uh, unreasonable. So for example, uh, here on the left, what I'm showing you is uh, uh, the wedges or the spread uh, where the payments uh, that the uh, savers uh, uh, receive uh, versus what borrowers make to the non-bank sector is essentially plotted here. So this is like an implicit cost. So essentially what this is telling you is if you look at the two lines there, one is the government and the other is the private sector, uh, the securities and technology cost is going down, which means the non-bank sector is becoming more efficient over time. And the decline in these, uh, 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 these estimates line up with the trends that I showed you before. Similarly, on the right-hand side is saver preferences for debt securities. And what you see is that the demand of savers relative to deposits kind of goes up for both government and private securities around the time that I showed you that the shadow uh, money and the shadow sector kind of exploded. So that kind of lines up pretty well as well. And lastly, if I look at the estimation of bank subsidies, on the left, the numbers are too small, uh, but on the left, what I'm plotting is uh, subsidies on the uh, bank loan side, and on the right-hand side, among other things, are subsidies to the uh, deposits and to the bank equity. Uh, again, the Levels are not uh, identified in any of these things because of the normalization, but trends are. So on the left, when you look at the subsidy uh, to the, on the loan side, what this is telling you is actually the subsidy is going down. The costs are actually increasing, and there is a much higher increase in cost post the uh, 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 2007 crisis. On the right-hand side, it's telling you that if you look at the subsidies to the deposit and equity side, it's kind of going up, especially uh, post the uh, 2007, so you can think about too big to fail kicking in in a very explicit manner. Uh, in the work that we are doing right now, what we do is we take all of these time series estimates that we have and project it on various things like regulation indices, technology indices, wealth uh, share, share of uh, intangible versus tangible projects in the economy to allow us to interpret this, but this is still work in progress, so uh, looking forward to hearing your comments as well as uh, our discussion on this. So in the last uh, a few minutes that I have, let me just tell you the two things that I said that the model allows us to do. One is it allows us to decompose uh, the lending on and off balance sheet. So what's this exercise? We look at the world with 1963 parameters and then iteratively change the other parameters to see how much of lending would change both on the balance sheet and in total. Uh, so you can change uh, securitization uh, efficiency, you can change saver preferences, you can change subsidies and then all of them together. So what is the bottom line here that is worth sort of talking about? So bank balance sheet lending on the left and total lending on the right. Uh, when uh, technology changes, so you can think about this as saying that non-bank intermediation becomes more efficient, uh, total lending increases while the bank uh, lending, bank balance sheet lending shrinks. Uh, and like I said, the reason is because you have substitutes now available, so non-bank intermediation uh, allows you to dampen any effect of bank balance sheet contracting. Similarly, you can ask the question about preferences, uh, uh, which is saver demand as well as bank uh, wedges. Uh, both of them 
tend to reduce uh, the bank balance sheet. So for example, if the saver preferences is that uh, moving away from deposits, like I showed you, that means that bank balance sheet is going to contract uh, potentially, and that has some effect on lending, but not as much because non-banks can substitute and so on. Together, uh, you can see that what this says is that bank balance sheet is not the same as total lending because total lending actually goes up while bank balance sheet uh, lending contracts at the same time. Uh, we can see this in one more way, which is the last uh, uh, exercise that I'm going to talk about, uh, which is you can take a counterfactual where you increase the capital requirements pretty dramatically and ask the question, what does it do to uh, bank balance sheet and total lending uh, in 1963 and 2023? So what do you find? You find that there is a large effect on bank balance sheet lending, uh, both in uh, 63 and uh, 2023, whereas the total lending doesn't, affect, uh, doesn't get affected as much. Uh, the effects are much stronger in 1963 over 2023. Why is this, this the case? Some of this intuition should already be uh, clear to you because of what I said before. Uh, so essentially, non-banks can potentially be good substitutes for bank credit. That's what uh, tells you why the total effect is smaller. And also, when banks are contracting, the first order adjustment is on bank security holdings. And of course, both of these things uh, are uh, uh, on steroids in 2023 relative to 63. That's why the effects are uh, so much different between the two uh, years. Uh, so this sort of gets to the point that I said before, that like when you look at the aggregate, it doesn't seem like uh, a bank balance sheet getting impaired affects total lending, at least as the economy stands in the US. So there's a bunch of robustness, but I'm uh, running out of time. So let me conclude. So we try to argue that uh, there's a very important trend over the last 60 years, which is worth sort of noticing. If you zoom back, uh, bank balance sheet lending has declined. Uh, this has implications for macro prudential and financial regulation. As you can see in the Basel III discussion, this fact is completely forgotten. Uh, we think that uh, this is quite important because bank substitution effect clearly is dom dom dominating any other view you might have where bank-centric view is very critical for total lending. It might be critical for many other things, but for total lending, which is the source of discussions, doesn't seem to be as important. Uh, what does this sort of tell us in, in conclusion? It tells us that as regulators are thinking about policy analysis, we got to think a little bit more broadly. Uh, what that also means is collecting data, not just on bank balance sheet call reports, but also non-banks, and also trying to understand where banks and non-banks are competing and where there are complements, because that obviously plays a role in all of the quantitative exercise that I did. So thank you. So the discussion is going to be Nietje van Horen, as, who is a senior research advisor at the Bank of England, a professor of financial economics at the University of Amsterdam. And while you take the microphone, I just want to say, I don't think that in Europe we have forgotten about all these things. So uh, there is actually a consultation by the European Commission about the macroprudential implications and potential changes needed about the non-bank financial intermediation. And on the data issues you mentioned, you're probably aware, I mean, there are huge initiatives and workforces, task forces under the Financial Stability Board, and we are in integrative part of that. But uh, that's going away from the paper, so Nelia will uh, give the discussion, 15 minutes. Great. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to discuss this paper. It's been a great paper to, to think about because we don't often look at like secular changes. We often look at what happens around crisis or shocks, and it's really nice to take this broader view. So let me just quickly recap uh, the paper. There is, it's, it's a very rich paper, and it has three key contributions. So the first one is that it documents three secular trends in the US bank balance sheet. The second one, that they, uh, the authors develop a model uh, where there is an interaction between the bank balance sheet and the uh, OTD. And that helps to understand the drivers behind trends, and particularly also how the drivers uh, are differentially important in different par uh, points in time. And finally, uh, they assess the impact of capital and liquidity requirements in the 1960s versus now in line of these uh, changing trends. So what are the three secular trends? So the first one is a sharp decline in uh, informationally sensitive bank balance sheet lending. 
The second one is a decline in the deposit share of uh, savings. And in the, in the paper, it implicitly, uh, the idea behind it is it's household savings, but I will get uh, into that in a second. And the third one is that the loans as percentages of bank assets dropped. So the model then looks at three uh, different trends behind these different, uh, sorry, uh, three different drivers behind these trends. So the first one is the technological improvements in debt securities issuance. And that, was, that drive was very dominant in the early phase, uh, so in the 1970s and uh, 290s. And it pre predominantly drove the changes in aggregate lending. Then the second one is a shift in saver preferences that was predominant in the mid 1980s to 2000s and that had a biggest impact on the impact on the bank balance sheet size and the amount of deposit funding. And finally, it's the involvement of uh, government regulations, and particularly after the global financial crisis, and that altered, uh, had, a, had the biggest impact on the uh, balance sheet composition. Then the final part of the paper, which I think is particularly uh, important and intriguing, is the changing impact of capital and liquidity uh, regulations. So we see that um, the a tightening of these regulations now, because of these changes in, in the bank balance sheet, has less an impact in total lending, because there is now more ability for substitution between banks' balance sheet uh, loans and debt securities. So that's the paper in a nutshell, and I think it's a very nice way to look at uh, starting to think about about all these uh, big changes that have, uh, have occurred. So the key takeaway is that the financial sector now is more resilient to regulatory changes due to shifts in household preferences and declining frictions in OTD intermediation. So what I want to do in my discussion, I want to think about a little bit other trends that have not necessarily uh, been focused on in the paper, which really looks at broad aggregate trends. But uh, so I want to look at uh, the, the trends in corporate savings. Um, the, I would like to see a little bit the differences in household versus corporate borrowers. And then on the banking side, the trends in banking concentration. So let's start with corporate savings. So the, the savings behavior, this is a statement from the paper, it states savers behavior rather than borrower demand or bank lending opportunities has become a key driver in determining the size and composition of the bank's balance sheet. And I think that's a very important statement. But underneath the, the, the model and the thinking, I think, behind the, uh, the paper is that the paper's basically focuses on the savings behavior of households. So I would like to have a look in what, the, what happened in the corporate saving side. So we see this is a, a paper that looks at uh, the diverging trends in corporate and household savings uh, across the world. And you see that there is this, an increase in corporate savings relative to household savings. And that's, uh, this is the, 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 the average across countries, but they document that this has the, these trends you see in various countries and across various industries. So there's been quite a rich literature, quite a recent literature, focusing on what, what are these drivers increased corporate savings. Uh, there is uh, papers that, the paper that I showed you, the graph about is, uh, shows its increases in firm profits. There is also a precautionary savings uh, motive after shocks. There is uh, papers that show that a, uh, uh, firms tend to save more because of R&D intensive IPOs. And there is a desire to minimize taxes. And finally, there's, of course, this overarching uh, idea that um, when you have high cash holdings, it's easier to fund investment opportunities outright, uh, or you can secure better loan terms. Often, when we think of these drivers and when we think about corporate savings, we think about the big multinationals, the Apples, uh, Microsoft, Alphabet. They have huge savings, and they also have very sophisticated ways of dealing with those savings. So they probably don't hold them. Uh, as deposits uh, in the banking sector. But if we start looking into this a bit more uh, clearly, there seems to be a, a drive of corporate uh, savings in the banking sector as well. So this paper looks at the uh, secular trend in US corporate savings. And what it shows is that cash held by US company increased from 1 trillion in 1994 to 4 trillion in 2016. And according to the paper, it's now 5.8 trillion in 2022. So there's a huge increase. Of course, this is 
the, the, the increase is by, by and large driven by uh, multinationals. And what this paper shows, it's not the full period, it shows this for uh, 1998 to 2008. It shows that the green line and the blue line, that's what multinationals are saving. And these multinationals save a relatively small amount in the U, uh, US financial sector uh, because they uh, um, redirect their savings to other countries where taxes are lower. However, what I want to point at is the red dots because these are the non-multinational uh, domestic corporates in the uh, US. And what you see is that their savings are high and that they also have increased in this 10-year uh, period, has doubled as well. So if you look then at the corporate savings on banks' balance sheets, then you see there is a sharp secular trend here as well. So we see a secular increase and it's also quite volatile of corporate uh, deposits. So if we think about secular changes in safer preferences, I think it would be very interesting to take these uh, corporates into account as well. So what I would like to see is, is there a, what is the share and the composition of deposits on the bank's balance sheet? Do we see a secular shift towards uh, corporate savings relative to household savings? And also, if you think about the technologies or the, the technical changes, they seem to relate mostly to, to the household savings sector and not so much to the corporate savings. So I can imagine that these trends and the drivers behind these trends are very different. Uh, this can have implications for the model because should we expect that the utility weight and the substitutability of these two savers uh, uh, segments are similar or different? I don't know, but we do know that there is a differential behavior to shocks of uh, corporate deposit uh, holders. They, they tend to be more flightly, flighty when there is uh, problems in, the banking uh, in a bank as we saw in uh, SVB, but also other banks. Uh, they might also be more responsive to business cycle fluctuations. So my second point is a little bit related, but then goes to the, to the borrower demand side. So if we think about uh, the lending technologies in the 1960s, this is of course an extreme simplification, but there is a, a, a diff, um, demand for either info-sensitive or info-insensitive loans. In the 1960s, by and large, the household sector, the SMEs, and the large corporates were only able to borrow information-sensitive loans. If we then compare this to 2023, then we see a huge shift because of many of these technological changes. The household sector, and particularly in the US, there is a huge um, demand or, or preference or um, uh, supply of info information insensitive loans because of these conforming loans in the mortgage market. The Jumbo loans, which would be the information sensitive loans, are presumably a much smaller share of the total uh, lending and the total preferences as well from the borrower sector. If we then look at the SMEs, they might have some access to the bond market in Europe, very, very limited. But let's say for argument's sake that the SMEs can only borrow information sensitive loans. The corporates, they have uh, the big corporates, the multinationals and the large firms, they can borrow uh, both uh, information sensitive and information insensitive loans. So, if you then think of this uh, in terms a bit of the model, so there, for the households, there would be a high preference of information, insensitive borrowing, and uh, limited substitutability. Most mortgage holders can only borrow uh, one type. Uh, and the trend is towards information insensitive loans. The corporates is a very different story. So the preferences or even the, the ability to borrow information sensitive loans uh, and the substitutability really depends on the corporate type. Uh, on the aggregate, which is of course driven by the large corporates, we see that there is a trend towards um, insensitive loans, um, uh, but probably less so than the households. And for the SMEs, there is likely no changes in preference or, or ability to borrow. And this is kind of what you see in, in your data as well. There is a huge, clear secular decline in mortgage lending. That's the, the left graph. Um, but if we look at the right graph, and then particularly in the, the it's the purple line, the, the lowest line, you see there is some secular decline in corporate, corporate lending, 
but much less pronounced um, than what we see in the mortgage market. But when we then go to the model, um, we kind of have a representative borrower, which is all non-government uh, net borrowers in the economy, which it's just implicit, explicitly, it's a combination of the household and the firm. And also the, the time uh, series information on the sensitive and the insensitive loans are taking these two segments together and the key parameters as well. And then there is an, an, an underlying assumption that the composition of financial projects is lar largely fixed over time. When you think about these different uh, trends, different secular trends, I am not so sure that this is a reasonable assumption. Um, and I wonder, and I think that's possible, if you could separate in your model the household and the corporate borrowers and uh, look at these different trends. This matters if you also think about any change impact of the tightening of the capital and liquidity ratio. So what, what the paper shows or what the model shows is that the tightening of the capital or the liquidity ratio has now a weaker impact on total lending. And mainly due to a reallocation or the ability to reallocate the credit. So it's a substitution of the information sensitive to the information insensitive lending. Initially you would think is good news, but if you think a bit deeper, I think no. That's not good news because to some extent what, um, what we saw in the 1960s when there is a tightening of the capital uh, ratio that all segments would be more or less equally affected. There might be a little bit of shift because banks might uh, want more lending to sectors that have more information, for example, but not because of this substitution. Currently, the different segments are very differently affected. The households might even benefit because if there is a shift to banks wanting information in sensitive loans, they might be more willing to uh, lend uh, conforming mortgages. The large corporates, I would su suggest, can substitute, so they're mostly unaffected. But then the SMEs will take the full brunt because they have no ability and the banks are pulling out of information uh, sensitive lending. So in a way, there is a, a, the shift to me, the secular shift, is that there is a market segmentation in the impact of, of a tightening. And I think the model can, when, once you start differentiating between the different segments in the borrower market, you can potentially shed light on this. So the last, uh, last point in the last uh, minute and a half is, has to do with, this is of course aggregates, and, and it's really great to look at the aggregates, but the aggregates are driven obviously by the large banks in the economy. And in the US, that's, it's a very, very concentrated market. This is the US landscape in 2016. And if you look at the, the, the big four, uh, and then the second one, the 111 uh, institutions in light blue, in total, these banks capture um, more than 80% of all the bank assets. Does this matter in, in the secular trends? Yes, it seems to matter quite a great deal because we also see, and this, this graphs, uh, I couldn't get data before, 20, uh, before uh, 2000, but this graph shows a, a big increase, a doubling of the concentration of the US banking sector over time. So the question then is, are the sector changes um, bank balance sheet general? Uh, or is it a lot of the, the change that we observe has to do with the increased concentration, the increased role of these very big key uh, banks? And do we see like a very uh, an increased heterogeneity or a segmentation in the financial system uh, due to these, these trends and in combination with this increase in concentration? So to conclude, I think this paper provides a really great insights in how banks' balance sheet have changed over the past 60 years, including the drivers and the implications of it. My wish list for this, or presumably for a future paper, because the current paper is already very rich, is to add the corporate savings and to also differentiate between uh, the mortgage and the corporate lending market, and then particularly the SMEs versus the large corporates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nietzsche. You, while the audience gathers its thoughts, maybe you want to relate. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for uh, excellent discussion and great points here. Uh, I'll just say briefly about uh, the three points that you raised. Uh, the point about corporate savings is a, a very uh, well-taken point. Right now, what we have in the data is uh, 
savings of the non-financial sector together, uh, but we could try to separate it out and see uh, what we get. Uh, the second point, which is kind of related, is about the borrower demand and different segments. I think that's a very reasonable uh, suggestion. One, one complication that we face when we are estimating the model is uh, you need to see the returns of, uh, in the long time series for returns made to loans to SMEs, to households, to big corporate sectors separately to be able to tease out and do a quantitative exercise. Right now, the series that's available going back in time uh, is at a very aggregated level. So if we can find it, uh, the machinery can easily accommodate that. Yeah. Uh, but I agree with you. That's something that's been part of uh, and parcel. Luke actually had discussed our paper and raised something similar. Uh, so this is something that we should uh, try to do. I'll say just one thing about the concentration. I think you're exactly right that the concentration sort of kicked up uh, uh, big time post the, especially the uh, financial crisis. Uh, if you look at most of the secular changes, they happened in 80s and 90s. Uh, so I think this probably gets more to the subsidies and the costs of regulation that are being imposed and we are extracting from the data. I think you're right that those costs are probably uh, falling more on certain types of banks, smaller, medium-sized banks, and not the big banks. Uh, and uh, there might be something that we can do there and, and look at it as well. So thanks and great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Questions? Marie? Let's start with Marie. ECB. So you focused on lending, and you argued very convincingly that total lending is very resilient because there is a substitution from banks to non-banks when banks are constrained. So from the point of view on the metric of lending, it seems like good news, and I was wondering whether it is good news. There are other metrics. You can look at financial stability, for example, and then you can argue, well, lending might be shifting to non-banks. They're less regulated. Should we be worried? So I was wondering about your thoughts on the welfare or efficiency implications of these trends. Thank you. Should we collect? Let's, let's know. Well, go, go ahead. We'll answer that one. Uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right that we don't look at risk, uh, partly because it's difficult to measure this. Uh, we have tried to do this uh, in a more uh, comprehensive manner, only looking at mortgages, because there we can do all that. And uh, it doesn't seem, at least in the last 15 years, that risk is something that's, you know, there's this view that like, if you increase the non-bank sector, risk will just migrate there and that's a problem potentially. You don't see that uh, at least in the last 15 years in the mortgage sector. That doesn't mean that it's not gonna happen in the other spaces. Uh, this gets to the whole debate about whole FinTech and big tech lending and are these AI models gonna be cycle proof or is this just gonna be overfitting of data and so on uh, remains to be seen. We, we don't have the data to be able to answer that for the entire sector that we are looking at, uh, but it's something that we want to sort of think about and it's a very fair point. Yeah, it's gonna be critical for your prudential conclusion you had mentioned, no? Yes. Have the data, so I saw Livio first and then Jerome next. So thank you. So Livio Straka, ECB. Um, so uh, so my question is a bit similar to the previous one, and also one of the points made by the discussants. So um, so if you believe that uh, that banking is special, uh, that uh, you know the banks have a deposit franchise, and therefore they can produce lending or you know loans or lending in a cheaper, more efficient way than non-bank intermediaries. You know, and there is a huge issue on that. You know, on fraction. So what, what I mean, I guess the consequence of that is is that you know the shift towards non-bank should increase the cost of credit. So in other words, the bank should be able to produce lending the cheaper, uh, uh, you know, in a cheaper way for 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 borrowers than MBFIs. Uh, so, uh, which is also related to the point on SMEs uh, made by the discussion. So, so do you find that you know is is it an outcome that? Uh, uh, because that would, that would be a very important point. Because I mean, and right now there is a lot of discussion about bank disintermediation, you know, due to say, I mean, in Europe 
we're going to be introducing a digital euro, for example, and banks complain okay. that there is this intermediation. So, what is the cost of this? No, because it doesn't seem to show on the on the total lending, but it shows in the cost of lending. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, you know the, that that's the reason that we are trying to measure the wedge between uh, bank and non-bank, so sensitive and informationally insensitive. And the way to think about it is that uh, everything else is the same. If the market share of non-banks is increasing, that's telling you that over time that the efficiency of this non-bank sector is going up. That's the only way the market share otherwise wouldn't move to the non-bank sector over time. Uh, put another way, like with all the hard information, with all the different kind of models available out there, maybe it is st it's still the case that banks are special, but they are not needed for many of the loans which can be outsourced because what banks used to do, like with the loan officers and all those kinds of things, maybe with technology and other things, that information is available out there and that wedge has gone down over time. That's all this is saying. It's not saying that the wedge is such that the bank market share needs to go to zero, it just doesn't need to be as large. And once that happens, the system is more resilient as far as total lending is concerned, your point notwithstanding. Jérôme uh, European Central Bank. So it seems you've triggered a lot of interest for uh, <laughs> colleagues here. Um, I think having the US only uh, approach on this is of course triggering interest on our side and like forward looking trends or, or whatever. Uh, my questions relate a bit to a different thing, the asset sides of, of what you've been presenting and I'm wondering whether your setup could capture or can capture two features that have to do with uh, equity holdings by households because you mentioned the saving preferences. Uh, I could figure out that if they would sort of go more into equity, if you look at equity prices, there could be triggers there, or I mean, both ways, uh, supply and demand driven uh, upward shift in the household's preference, which would mean less deposits for the banks and less lending at the end of the day, just on what you said or on other aspects. The second thing is about the relation between non-banks and, and banks with a particular focus, as Maria mentioned, uh, leave you as well, financial stability aspects. Non-banks hold or can hold uh, equity of banks, also securities of banks, and this is possibly a sort of channel through which issues on the lending or liquidity side could be anyway going back to banks. So I'm wondering whether you see some concern there and whether, again, you, you can or could capture that in your setup. Uh, yeah, so I think on the equity uh, preference of households over time, that's happening in the background because part of the shift of uh, households or corporates which are lumped together away from deposits means that they are investing other things like equity. We haven't looked at equity per se, but that's something that we can easily look at. Uh, that's a fair point. Uh, on the non-bank bank linkages, remember that there is, uh, banks are buying uh, uh, securities that non-banks issue. So there's that linkage. And you're saying that non-banks can also be buying some of the equity of banks and other kind of things which could uh, create more linkages and potentially uh, create a different kind of channel. We have not looked at that. Actually, uh, most of the non-bank balance sheet data where we can look at more micro level uh, detail, they don't seem to have a lot of uh, uh, other investments they do. It's mainly they originate loans and just originate to distribute. Uh, but it's something that could happen in the future. One thing which is worth mentioning, it's outside the scope of this paper, is that if you look at, for example, non-banks getting to the point about risk, in the mortgage sector, which is a pretty big sector in the US, non-banks have uh, a huge market share now in that, in that market. And if you look at the equity of non-banks, equity capital, remember they are not regulated, the equity capital is 25%. Uh, so you know, uh, maybe the market is telling them that, okay, they, if, if you're gonna be more risky, maybe you're less special than banks, you got to keep more equity. So in that sense, there is more resilience there because that's what the market is demanding. But it's just mortgages. I don't know about the other non-banks. As you know, there's a big debate going on related to private credit, which is all about this. <laughs> 
So that would bring this session uh, to an end. We resume in 22 minutes at 11.10, and it will continue with banking and credit. But let us ask, um, thank our presenters again with a round of applause.